Well, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I know that today is what this world considers Easter Sunday. I know it to be so because I've saw all of the things that all the religious organizations have done over the previous several weeks in preparation leading up to this weekend. In a way, I, I, I like the time that it gives me to be with my family, but in reality it's the, the, the mindset and the ideas that natural men come up with concerning these historic events is quite tragic in reality. Yeah, you know, I wrote this in my notes to begin with. You know, it's, it's tragically sad. I've entitled this message, Jesus Made Both Lord and Christ. Jesus Made Both Lord and Christ. Acts chapter 2, we're going to read in just a minute, verses 14 through verse 36. But, you know, it, it's tragically sad when you think about it how mankind and all their various religions, no matter their denomination, no matter their creed, all of them declare as a gospel truth what is little more than in reality a caricature of the actual accomplished work of redemption performed by the God-sent Messiah. Most people that you and I know, friend, family, and foe, people who we encounter, people whom we love, people whom we respect, they are more than content to bask in the mere husk of certain religious holidays and ceremonies. That is to say, uh, for example, Christmas or Easter, like what we're talking about, or Good Friday that just occurred this previous Friday. I always thought in my mind, how in the world they get through that? You know, I used to, I figured it out. Now I look at it and think, how do you get three days between Friday and Sunday? It don't work. You can do the math on it. It just doesn't work out. But, folks, the reality of it is this. Christ came. Christ lived. Christ died. Christ rose again. He ascended to glory, and he sits now at the right hand of the majesty on high to give eternal life to all that the Father gave him. That's, that's the story of the Scripture. That's not the Easter story. I hope you understand that. That's the reality of what this book teaches us about. Everything from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is a progressive revelation, a clearer uh, declaration of a God who determined within, him own, within his own self to glorify himself as both a just God and a Savior. That's what we're here for. It's not so we can enjoy this thing. I mean, though we do get to enjoy it, do we not? I'm 63 years old now. And when I look back over my life, I, my next-door neighbor was picking at me the other day. He said, he said, you can't go back to Hawaii. And I said, why? He said, you ain't had the vaccine. And that's right. If you don't have the vaccine, you can't go to Hawaii. That's something in the United States, you cannot go to Hawaii. I told him I've been. I don't have to go back. I've been. But I tell you what, I, I, I've got to meet a variety of brethren across this country. I've got to visit other countries by virtue of me and Pam getting to travel together. I've got to see my boys grow up. I've got to see my grandchild born. I've got to see all you, all of us, age so gracefully together throughout the years. Now you think about where we were. I, I think about that a lot. When I first met you folks, the ones that were with us from the beginning, Buddy and Bart and Sally and Dave and Abby, I was a 28-year-old 20, kid. And now here we are, 36 years later, 35 years later, and quite a bit has changed. But we're not content to just bask in the husk of religion. Not at all. But you know, really, the fact that men by nature take so much pride and put so much energy and effort into these religious holidays and ceremonies, it shouldn't surprise us. See, and that's exactly what <clears throat> occurred after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. You imagine the events that had occurred in the eyes of these Jewish people 
They had, they, now think about that. We're going back to Israel, to Jerusalem. These Jews had witnessed the trial and they had witnessed the public humiliation of our Lord Jesus Christ as well as not only witnessing it, they demanded his death through the humiliation of crucifixion. Listen to this. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him, Pilate, to do as he had done before unto them. But Pilate answered him and said, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Crucify him. These folks actually witnessed and they celebrated as Christ hung out there. And they thought of him as little more than a thief or a criminal. They witnessed, these Jews, that, that in this mass of humanity that's gathered here for the day of Pentecost that Peter's about to preach the gospel to, they actually witnessed and celebrated as Christ, celebrated as Christ hung there. They witnessed the, the day turn to night in the middle of the day. They felt the earth shake. And folks, they were present when the veil in the temple was rent in half. Yet they remained unmoved. Many of them, now think about this. I said this in the Sunday Bible class. I already say it again. Many of them had seen or at least heard of the fact that because of all these events that occurred in Jerusalem at this time, that the dead were raised. Now, when I think about that, that they, they, they were made aware that folk, there were some folks that were in the ground that got up and walked, them, walked around again. And I think about that rich ruler. He said, send, send, my, send my brothers back. And let me go back and warn my brothers. He said, if one raised from the dead, they won't hear him. They wouldn't hear our Lord Jesus Christ. They, they weren't affected by any of it, were they? Matter of fact, we know that to be the case because look at verse 1 of chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now what is the day of Pentecost? It's a celebration according to the old Mosaic covenant. That Old Testament law. They were all with one accord in one place. In spite of all the events they had witnessed, Religious life continued just like it had previously. Through this celebration of Pentecost, the Jews, folks, you know what they were doing? They were continuing the ritualistic ceremonies of their fathers, their moms, their dads, their grandmas, their grandpas, all the way back, even though these events had been physically set aside by our God through the perfect fulfillment of all those things that were typical and typified the Lord Jesus Christ. Just 50 days earlier, our Lord Jesus Christ concerning, said, said concerning the law, he said it had been fulfilled. He said, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Christ's last words on the cross. It is finished. To lay To bring to its ultimate conclusion. Christ fulfilled exactly what he said. I know that to be the case because the Apostle Paul recorded these words in Colossians. He says, In you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's you and me, hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. How do you do that? How do you forgive me, a sinner, by birth, by nature, by practice, and by choice? How can you forgive me of all my transgressions, my trespasses? Here's how. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that is against us. What's that? That's the law. 
But not only is it against us, not only does it demand our death, it's contrary to us. The carnal mind's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And took it out of the way. How? Nailing it to his cross. Yet, here are these sinful Jews still seeking salvation in life and those things that could only bring one thing. Death. The wages of sin. Death. The law was given to point out what? How all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And see, it's in this religious environment <clears throat> among these rebels that God moved Peter to preach this glorious gospel message. You'd think that God would have been moved to pronounce death and condemnation on all of them for their being willing participants in the death of his only begotten son. But God Almighty had determined to show mercy to his people, the true Israel of God. And I don't have the time to go back and cover everything that's in this chapter. <clears throat> but I tell you what, I'd have you to notice the message itself. That's where we're going to look at this morning, verses 14 through verse 36. Only 22 verses. Just 22 verses. I've spoke more already in this introduction than what Paul wrote in this message that he's going to preach. 22 verses. Folks, Peter wasn't a theologian. He didn't have a theological degree. He was a fisherman. He had no formal education. Did he? He had no religious training. He wasn't raised in the synagogue. He wasn't like Samuel who had the privilege to sit under Eli. But I know this much, being taught of God... He knew God. And folks, he knew the way to God, did he not? And also, when you think about it, Peter's hearers were just ordinary folks, just like you and me. But notice the complexity of what he moved to declare to their ears. Look at verse 14 here in Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as you have supposed, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall uh, see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon unto blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved an amazing same thing Peter says here, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the, foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my tongue rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. 
Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Now, everything he said here, these people relate it to an earthly man in an earthly kingdom. And he said, let me, let me, let me be frank with you. Let me be up front with you. The patriarch David, that he is both dead and he's buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Well, don't you know that stopped their hearts? <laughs> oh, my God, how you dare you talk about David like that? Well, he's making what a point. What? There's a greater one than David. David wasn't looking to his kingdom. He was looking to a king that would sit on a throne whose kingdom would see no end. Therefore, being a prophet, and that's what David was. He was a prophet. And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loin, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. And his soul was not left in hell, in the grave. That's what that word hell means there. It wasn't left in the ground. Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not descended, ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foot." Might make thy foes thy footstool. Boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? We ought to read that many times, asking our God to give us light on it. But it brings us to our text for this morning. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 36. Therefore, in other words, based on what I've just told you about this patriarch David and the one of whom David wrote about, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, not another one, that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Like every gospel minister, Peter's entire message was caught up with one thing the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, people look at us, and you know, especially those who preach the gospel, and they act like we have some kind of multiple sort of messages to preach to people. Like the Apostle Paul, I listened to a message by Henry a couple weeks ago, and it, I, think I've ne I can't believe I've never preached on that particular verse, just on that isolation. Paul said this to the Corinthian believers, For I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. They were like, there's got to be something else. No. Paul said, I determined, to know, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ, His person, and Him crucified, His work. That's all we've got. Every time that I stand in this pulpit, every time any man stands in this pulpit, whether it's Alb or Kenny or Bill or any other man that ever stands in this pulpit, they better have but one message. Now, we can talk about a lot of different things, and we do talk about a lot of different things, but we don't talk about anything out from underneath this perspective. A sinner can only be saved, can only be brought to glory, not based on anything they've done or even been enabled to do but based exclusively upon what this person whom God raised from the dead, this very Jesus who these men and women crucified made him both Lord and made him Christ. And I want to point out to you this morning several facts that we can learn from these few words. God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. And here's the first one. In these words that this, this message that Paul, Peter has preached, these 22 verses plus this one that we've read, 
I see, first of all, this fulfillment of Joel's prophecy concerning the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is proof positive that the Lord Jesus Christ was exactly who he had declared himself to be. You think about it. Think about all the miracles our Lord Jesus Christ performed while he was on the, on the earth during his earthly ministry. Listen to you. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in the Cana of Galilee. What was the first miracle that he performed? Huh? He turned water into wine. And not just any wine, the best wine. From water. Folks, you know what that is? That's an act of creation. You say, why is that important? Because it connects him to the one who created all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so our Lord, to confirm that he himself was God, what did he do? He created out of one thing something that was totally different. He created wine. The, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And listen, when his glory is manifested, when it's revealed that he is God incarnate, the Messiah, sin of the Father, his disciples believed on him. Here's something else. Christ, by his own words, declared himself to be exactly who he said he was. I always think about this, that when our Lord Jesus Christ went to Nazareth, went home, went to the place where he was raised. It says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, this is what he found. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And he gave it again unto the minister, and he sat down. And it says, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. They're like, what did he pick this verse for? What did he read? And I tell you what, can you envision what it was like to hear the one who wrote this word, read this, quote this word? This ain't Richard Warmack or Henry Mahan or Bill Parker. This is Jehovah God speaking. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What does he mean? He was preaching the gospel to the poor. He was healing the brokenhearted. He was preaching deliverance to the captives. Recovering of sight, not physical sight. Folks, these are spiritual things. You, look, you can be blind with your eyes. If you have eyes to see him, you don't have to see him. I've never seen my Lord, have you? If I did, if you do, I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you see Christ, Woodland Hills is your destination over in Monroe. Something's wrong. I've never seen him. But all but I know he's real. I know there is a man sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. The man, Christ Jesus, God man. Look at verse 22 in our text that we read there in Luke and Acts. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know. Peter tells these same Jews that what they now saw that outpouring of the Holy Spirit lets them know assuredly, and that, that word assuredly means with certain knowledge, that Jesus was indeed who? He was the Christ, sin of the Father. Now they claim, when they saw it, what did they say? These dudes are drunk with wine. 
But Peter reproves them. He says, no, 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 no. We're not drunk with wine. It's but the third hour of the day. What time is it? Nine o'clock in the morning. But we're not drunk with wine. So he's saying again to these Jews, you are without excuse. Joel's words have been fulfilled in this person. Here's the second truth we see in Peter's word. Is it in this matter of salvation, eternal life? God is the absolute first cause in all things. Absolute first cause. That God, listen to it, hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. I know it's popular and accepted language in false religion today for men and now even women in my generation to encourage sinners, and you and I were taught this way by well-intentioned, though deluded individual, to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Weren't we? Have you ever had any experience with anything outside of the gospel of God's free grace? I guarantee you at some point, somebody, some Sunday school teacher, some evangelist, some preacher begged and encouraged you to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and he set the mood properly. In my case, when we were back out at, at Heiko and when we were over at Broadacres together, they had dimmed the lights, every head bow and every eye closed so it would make it as easy as possible. You couldn't be embarrassed if you went down because nobody would know till you were already up there. A lot of them even arrogantly claim that, that uh, you, you, Christ cannot and he will not be your Savior until you make him what? your Lord. Really? A sinner's going to make Christ Lord? I, that, that, this isn't something that's found in the scriptures, folks. But it's something that's conjured up in the minds of unregenerate sinners, those who are dead in trespasses and sin, because the reality is this, what has man done? Now think about it. We're going to, you, before Christ can be your Savior, you've got to make him your Lord. Can you do that? That's the question. Can anybody do that? Well, I'll tell you what we've done. Here's what we've done. A perfect man in a perfect place, in perfect fellowship with God, Adam, our representative man, what did he do? He chose sides with Satan, believing his lie, as opposed to God's truth. And his descendants, you and me included, with eyes wide open, we reject God's Christ, and they, we, demanded his death in Jerusalem. No matter how holy our noble sinners might be, considered by other sinners, folk, no sinner can make Jesus Lord or Christ. That's an act of God himself. God the Father, and the thing about it, God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. What does that mean? God the Father constituted and appointed Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, to be the Christ. Appointed him to be the Messiah. But folks, he also appointed him to be King of kings and Lord of lords. God the Father not only invested Jesus with the office and power and authority but manifested or revealed him to be both Lord and Christ by the Holy Spirit, which he received without measure, which he's now pouring forth on these people on the day of Pentecost. This very same Jesus who these Jews despised, rejected, and persecuted, and spat upon, and crucified, God made him both Lord and Christ. Why? Why did God do that? Christ purchased that right by his perfect life of obedience to God's law and justice, and by his vicarious death as a substitute and surety of all those whom he represented. You ought to have this verse memorized. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
Wherefore, because he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, the death of the cross, wherefore God hath all highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess. What do they confess? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That word Lord is an interesting word. I'm not going to try to dazzle you with the Greek word, but I will tell you what it means. It means simply, he to whom a thing belongs. He to whom a thing belongs. Or better than that, a person or thing about which he has the power of deciding their destination. Let me give you an example of Christ's lordship. In other words, his ownership of a particular people and the power of his deciding. Look over at Romans chapter 8. Here's the lordship of Christ. Because here's the thing. Doesn't he own us lock, stock, and barrel? Know you not you bought with a price? What was the price? This glorious person, both body and soul. Look at verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, how's he for us? He owns us. Who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What all things does he give us? Verse 28, the one that everybody knows, that the world misquotes, it actually belongs to the elect of God. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So he gives us everything necessary that's for his glory, for our good, and for the advancement of his kingdom. Here we go. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Why? He owns us. You can't charge me with something when I belong to somebody else. It's God that justifies. Who's he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that's risen again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. See, here's the thing. The unregenerate sees God sovereign. They, they can't see this sovereign right of God, and they can't bow to this sovereign right of God, and they certainly would never submit to it. Paul told those at Corinth, Wherefore I give unto you that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord. But one way. But by the Holy Spirit. But God the Father, folks, he made this same Jesus, declaring him to be so by the revelation of God, the Holy Spirit, he made him Lord and Christ. That's what this word, second word is. Made him Lord. Made him the one to whom all belongs that he purchased. But he made him also Christ. And that's that word Christos, which literally means the anointed. He made him the Messiah. Who was Messiah? Messiah was the one appointed by God, promised by God, prophesied by the Father, and sent by the Father to actually save his people, those chosen people, both Jew and Gentile, in every single solitary generation. But here's the last truth we gain from these words. This same Jesus, here, here it is, whom you crucified. Whom you crucified. Now I know it's a lot of people like to blame those people over there across the ocean for crucifying our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that it was indeed the house of Israel, because Peter even accuses them. He lays the charge against them, does he not? In his sermon, he's preached, you crucified God's Christ. But you know, here's the thing. They might have did the act, but what was it that demanded his death? It wasn't their desire, it was the sins of all the elect, of all the ages, demanded Christ's death on that cross. 
You think about it, all of us, all of God's elect, both Jew and Gentile, lost in Adam, in the fall. What are we under? We're under the curse. For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law for to do them. Have you done that? Have you kept the law? Are you keeping the law? I tell you, if you're under the law, you're under the curse. You're not under the blessing of God. The only way that curse could be removed, what's got to happen? One who's both willing and able to effectively bear it away is typified by that scapegoat in the book of Leviticus. Who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ, whom God made both Lord and Christ. On the night of our Lord Jesus Christ's passion, while he prayed in the garden, what was his plea? said he went forward a little and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it was possible the hour might pass from him and he said Abba Father all things are possible unto thee take away this cup from me nevertheless not what I will but what thou will now listen to me closely and we'll quit with this this morning had there been any way possible for sinners to be saved other than through the death of this person, him being made both Lord and Christ, when Christ prayed that prayer, you know what God would have done? He would have let him go free. Now, he would have. And see, here's the thing. It's not when Christ prayed this prayer, it wasn't that he was seeking to be spared. What he was doing was he was showing to you and me the reality of what was required to save his people from their sin. I, I wrote this into my notes yesterday afternoon. I was going back over. What's, what's the price of redemption? Do you know? You know, when Job was sitting out there and those miserable comforters had come out there and spoken, finally Elihu spoke up and he looked at Job and he said to Job after Job had given his own defense he said then he is gracious unto him and saith deliver him talking about Job deliver him from going down to the pit I have found a ransom I have found a ransom you know what that word ransom means it means the price of life. God found the price of life. What's the price of life? Atonement. What's the price of life? Propitiation. Or the way the word is originally translated, you know what it is? It's pitch. It's pitch. And the first time it's used in the scriptures, you know where it's used at? It's used concerning the ark. Listen to you. Make thee, remember Noah's found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He said, make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms thou shalt make in the ark, and pitch it within. It's like tar. Put tar on the inside and pitch it without. Why? It protected that boat from the water getting through that wood. See, here's the thing. God found the price of life. God found the atonement or the reconciliation of sinners one place. Where did he find it? He found it in the person and work of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is in fact our ark, is he not? Pitched within and without. Paul said this, and I'll quit with this, and all things are of God. Who hath, listen, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. What are we to tell sinners? Here it is. To wit, that is to say that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. How did you do it? Not imputing their trespasses unto them 
and hath committed unto us that word of reconciliation. What's the word? He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I pray that God the Holy Spirit has caused us to look on him whom we pierced and given us eyes to see that that same Jesus whom we crucified, God hath made that same very one both our Lord and our Christ to the glory of God the Father. Let's stand together and we dismiss. I appreciate your presence. Lord bless you. Keep you till we see you. Next.